Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is my New York. My guest today arrives under an assumed name. When he lived in the Bronx, he was Eddie Schwartz, drawing funny pictures and yearning to get out. His illustrations, mordant satires mostly, won him a job at Esquire magazine, and he became Edward Sorrell. Renowned caricaturist, illustrator, cartoonist for Vanity Fair, The New Yorker, The Atlantic Monthly, among others, and the winner of the George Polk Award for Satiric Drawing. His most recent book is Mary Astor's Purple Diary, a jaunty tale of a steamy Hollywood sex scandal and a wry personal account of Sorrell's lifelong obsession with the actress, Ms. Astor. Not for nothing, the book also explains how he chose his name. Edward Sorrell, next. Ed Sorrell, it's a delight to have you with us. And this book, Mary Astor's Purple Diary, is such fun. Thank you. Uh, it's touching. It's, uh, it's part of your story. It's, of course, her story. I guess bio of both of you to a certain extent and so many rapturous drawings. It's, it's a wondrous thing. How did you get um, interested in Mary Astor? It was fate. I moved into a railroad flat that was run down. I had just married, and uh, my wife said, you've got to replace the kitchen linoleum. This is when? Nin this is 1965. Uh -huh. And, uh, and I, under four layers of linoleum, I came across the Daily News and the Daily Mirror, which were laid out to cover up the warped floor, and they were from July 1936. Wow. And they all had headlines the size of war declared <laughs> uh, about this trial in Los Angeles about a custody battle between Mary Astor and her husband for their daughter. And um, the reason it was a scandal was because he had stolen her diary in which she kept a careful account of all the men she was having affairs with. Yes, and uh, she, not only a careful account, but a, a pretty um, uh, explicit account of... Yes, especially, especially with an affair that she had in New York. She only used initials, but... Uh, this, <laughs> in the diary, yeah. This, this initial was G, yeah. and it quickly became aware, the husband became aware that the G in this case was... George S. Kaufman, the playwright the and playwright, former New York Times right. drama critic. I drama think. critic and man about town, supposedly the wittiest man in New York. Yeah. And, um, and apparently the, uh, a male, sort of a male um, nymphomaniac. Yes. I think that's what you call yeah. him in the book. No, that's what, uh, that's, what his, uh, that's what his producer called him, a male nymphomaniac. Well, uh, I don't want to get uh, too prurient, in, but uh, the, reason, the reason was he had an open marriage. It's questionable whether that was at his wife's desire or his, mm. but it was an open marriage, and, uh, and he was going to make the best of it by having all the women he could. Well, and he apparently did. Yeah. Uh, Mary Astor, is, it's so interesting to, to learn of this very uh, sensual and seductive and steamy side of her because, you know, you look at her on the screen, she doesn't come across as a sex bomb. She, she no, there's a reason for that. Her, her father, who was a German immigrant, was determined to have her articulate her speech very carefully so yeah. that by the time she went to grade school, she talked differently from all the other students because her speech was so articulated. And when her father, a terrible, terrible tyrant of a man, uh, forced her into becoming a silent screen actress, and the producer, uh, the head of, uh, the head of, 
uh, that studio uh, in New York. Power, that became Paramount eventually yeah. decided that her name had to be changed from Lang Hank into something that would fit on the marquee. Uh, changed her name to Astor because she seemed so, so upper class to him mm. that Astor would, was the only name that was suitable. So Lucille Lang Hank became Mary Astor. Yeah. At the time that dad forced her into this. Hollywood, uh, uh, much of it was still in New York. Yeah. Uh, but he wasn't smart enough to realize it no, was moving yeah. to California. He, he was a little behind the times. They were moving to California by then. There were, uh, there were 500 movies made every year in, that, in the 20s, uh, m more than that are even made now. Mm. Uh, and there were studios all over in, in New Jersey and Long Island, all over. There were just these tiny studios. And, uh, and he, uh, he somehow was able to get her a contract by showing still, still photographs of her. She was a great, great beauty. Mm. Well, um, he, he succeeds. She had no ambition for this. That's, yeah. a, that's a, such an interesting, all she wanted to do was get married and have kids. Yeah, she wanted to go to business school after high school and then get married and have kids. And uh, I don't know how someone who was so exquisitely beautiful could have ever led uh, that kind of pedestrian life. Yeah, she didn't seem to have, I guess I, I'm reading between the lines, but she didn't seem to have a lot of self awareness or self-confidence, I and mean, one can understand that given dad. Given who, dad, dad, dad didn't let her make any decisions, didn't let her have friends in the house, didn't let her go to other friends' houses. So she had no way of knowing how other families existed. He was a complete Prussian tyrant, and she wasn't allowed to make decisions for herself. And when she finally had to, as an adult, make decisions, she was incapable of making them, or, or at least not making good ones. Yeah, uh, he, 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 he used her as an ATM machine. I mean, he, yeah. he just took virtually all of her money, all the well, money she He made. did. He took all of her money and, uh, and threw it away. He was a damn fool, unfortunately. So he kept investing in, in terrible things, and uh, the money was gone. And she was, always, she was in debt all her life. Yeah. We're talking uh, with Ed Sorrell about his wonderful book. What a great read. Mary Astor's Purple Diary, referring to the uh, uh, diary she kept of her sexual escapades, which began when she was, what, 17 and, and just a pretty new silent star, but she got in a picture with John Barrymore. Well, as you know, what happened was that John Barrymore was taking the, uh, the 20th century to to Los Angeles, uh -huh. to, to Chicago on the way to Los Angeles. And, uh, and he picked up a movie magazine with her photograph, her 16-year-old photograph. Uh, and uh, underneath it said, on the verge of womanhood. <laughs> and Barrymore. That must had, have been catnip, too. It was catnip. Ca Barrymore made a habit of deflowering virgins, one of which, incidentally, was, uh, was the girl in the red the Red Velvet Swing, Evelyn Nesbitt. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, so, uh, so he insisted when he gets there, he tells, Par he tells Warner Brothers that he must have Mary Astor as his leading lady in Bo Brummel. Mm. And begins his project. And begins <laughs> his, project, his, his yeah. hunt. Which, was, uh, which required great ingenuity since, his, since Daddy seldom left her out of his sight. Yeah, he stuck at it for what, a year or so more before he actually got her alone. Yes, he uh, he it, it took some doing. I sh I should uh, I I don't know if our, our viewers need a reminder of who Mary Astor is, but perhaps her most famous role is uh, the woman in um, the, the Maltese, Maltese Falcon, she, Bridget uh, O'Shaughnessy. Yeah, yeah, she uh, double crosses. Humphrey Bogart and others. Well, she didn't get the chance, actually, but she tried. Yeah, she tried. Um, so you, you're not shy about talking about your obsession with this woman, uh, Mary Ass, and this story, which begins in that cold water flood. No, I think it reflects good taste on me. <laughs> it certainly does. <laughs> and in order to learn more, well, we have, we have um, 
we have uh, Barrymore deflowering her and then dropping her, you know, with, uh, that's a wonderful, he had, what was his uh, nickname for her, Goofer? Gooper, 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 Gooper. Gooper. Yeah, with a P-H, Goofer, yeah. That's a lovely drawing in the book of, you know, how he just brushes her off. Uh, well, he, to, to come to his defense to a certain extent, he, I think he really was in love with her. And I think he really did, even in spite of the age difference, he was 41, she was 17. In spite of that, I think he really did plan to make a great actress of her. But when he proposed that she be his leading lady on Broadway, acting in Shakespeare, the father wouldn't hear of it because they, it, not a, Broadway didn't pay as well as Hollywood yeah, did. Not enough money. And then he realized that she couldn't make decisions by herself. And so he fell in love with Dolores Costello. Is that your invention, his, his, um, his, uh, his words in that, in that drawing? No, no, no. That, or those no, he no. actually said? Those, those are from, she wrote, in 1959, she wrote her memoir. And those were her words right out of her book. And uh, I don't want to dissuade anybody from buying my book, but <laughs> Mary Astor's or, uh, memoir is uh, is even better than mine. I doubt that, but for if for no other reason, it doesn't have these rapturous uh, uh, illustrations. Um, so she she's in a she has a as you call it a starter marriage, and that go, he gets killed in a plane crash or yeah. something, and she marries a doctor, and it's not going well. Anyway, let's move on to her meeting George S. Kaufman, and that was apparently the love of her life, and that's what is in the diary, all the stuff they did together. Well, I think, I think she was madly in love with, with Kaufman, was sure that since he was in an open marriage to a woman who was overweight and and not nearly as beautiful as she was, uh, that he would leave her and marry her. Marry, uh, Mary. Ma would marry, Mary. But, uh, but he was really quite devoted to his wife mm. and uh, didn't, didn't believe in love. As uh, uh, once, uh, as, as Mary Astor, as I have Mary Astor report, report in the book, when he was doing a musical with, with Irving Berlin, and Irving Berlin had written a, 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 a song called I'll Be Loving You Always. Yes. Kaufman didn't think much of the title because look at the divorce rate. It, wouldn't it be better if you called it I'd Be Loving You Thursday? <laughs> and and uh, so he, he was a total cynic as far as love was concerned. He, Love didn't work out for him. But this is the grist for the mill of her diary. I mean, she writes stuff we can't even say on this program in that, and it becomes, yes. it becomes about her, you know, liaisons. The, no, the newspapers had to clean up her diary in order to, to report what was in it. Uh, oh, the reason that everybody knew what was in it, the, the court was going to, the court was going to keep the diary closed. But a reporter, a, a woman reporter from the Daily News, whose name I now forget, uh, bribed right. somebody in the law office to get the diary and photographed it so that the world knew what was in her diary. Well, it, I should have pointed out before now that the subtitle uh, to Ed's book, Mary Astor's Purple Diary, is The Great American Sex Scandal of 1936. And of course, the tabloids had a field day with this. Mm -hmm. It may have been the biggest, it may still be the biggest sex scandal out of Hollywood, who knows, but it was certainly. <laughs> it was right up there with, with Arbuckle, with yeah. Fatty Arbuckle. And, um, kind of put a bow on it. I mean, it, it, the trial comes about because in order to be with um, uh, Kaufman, mm. she gives up, she wants a divorce from the doctor. Yeah, she wants a divorce. Gives up custody yeah. of her daughter for well, the- Well, she gave up custody of the daughter because he said, if you leave, if, if you don't give me everything, which meant all your money, the house and the child, 
I'll reveal the diary to the world and you'll be through in Hollywood. Mm. That's, what, that's what made her give up the kid. It wasn't the love of Kaufman. She had no, by that time, I don't think she, she may have realized that he was never going to leave his wife. Yeah. And of 1936, she, or 35 or 36, she reconsiders what she's done and sues, and that's where the trial yeah. uh, happens yeah. and all the other stuff. Yeah. Um, how, and it comes out well for her, it, uh, I think. Yeah, it was one of those scandals that made her. Uh, she, well, she was, before the trial, she had already signed a contract with Sam Goldwyn to act in... In Dodsworth, the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the novel yes. by Sinclair Lewis that was being made into a movie. And uh, that was a very sympathetic role. And that role won her back the audience that she may have lost in the trial. Uh, it was the most appealing. If, if any of your audience has not seen Dodsworth, for God's sake, see it. It's one of the really great Hollywood movies from that period. And you report in the book that Sam Goldwyn had a very different take on her trouble. I mean, there's this, you know, steamy sex scandal yeah. going on. The papers are uh, eating it up. And everybody's worried about her as a potential star, but Sam sees it a different way. There was, which there, was interesting, very interesting. Yes, there was a lot of pressure on him, especially from the other movie producers. They had all ganged up on him in a conference room and uh, were pressuring him to take her out of the movie by using the morality clause, which mm -hmm. is in every contract yeah. that every actor signs. It, uh, and... Uh, and he refused to do it because he said a woman fighting for her, risking her life, risking her career to get her daughter, that's, that's noble and uh, yeah. people understand that. But the real reason that he wouldn't take her out was because Louis, May Louis B. Mayer wanted him to take her out. And he hated Louis B. Mayer because he had forced him out of Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Yes. And he hated, <laughs> he hated Louis B. Mayer. Uh, with all his might and... Uh, and showed it. And, sh and showed it. So many strains, so many interesting strains in this book, including, as I said at the top, how Ed Schwartz became Ed Sorrell is in here. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the, the other thing that I had in common with, uh, with Julian Sorrell was that Julian hated his father, too. So uh, that was one of the reasons. Julian Sorrell, the character from yeah, right. The Red and the Black. That's right. The protagonist, I guess. Right. So he, he what? He hated his father, too? Meaning yes, I didn't... Uh, you didn't care for your father? No, no, uh, no. You know, uh, my brother and I are quite old now, but whenever we get together, most of the evening is spent about how much we hated our father. <laughs> <laughs> well, you also, you told me uh, 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 earlier that Julian in... Sorrell in the in the book is a uh, uh, is a hunk. He's a he's a magnet for women. And you that yes. you like that part about it too? Yes, I couldn't I couldn't score to save my life. <laughs> uh, but uh, this was the nineteen. As a young man, huh? This was the nineteen fifties, and uh, and uh, Woody and Allen and I had the same problem. We just couldn't score. But uh, it was. Uh, so it was a hard time. So Julian Sorrell, be, I mean, Ju uh, Julian Sorrell was co-opted by Ed. Yeah. And yeah, well, I good for you. Yes. Uh, in, in the red and the black, as some of your readers will remember, his, uh, he is guillotined at the end. Yes. And the woman who still loves him takes his head and holds it to her bosom. His, his severed head and holds it to him. That was the kind of life I... I that was the kind of death I wanted. <laughs> per, perhaps could still have. Perhaps, I, I you know, hope not. I, I don't, it's too late to re lead the revolution now. Yeah, I, yeah. I well, maybe not. We should talk about revolution, which is... Um, uh, well, not revolution per se, but so much wonderful satire and anger in your drawings. I heard you say in your brother's film, my best drawings, I draw my, my best when I'm angry. 
Yeah, hate, hate is, uh, well, you know, uh, every boy that hates his father uh, has a big problem with authority. And uh, I am one of those, so uh, I'm, uh, these days are a little b difficult for me. Uh, and they have been uh, actually since the end of World War II, since I, uh, I, I felt that every president I lived through was the dumbest president that I've ever had to live through. And, but they just keep getting worse and worse and worse. And uh, I'm almost at my wit's end now. So I, Well, you're committing all of that hatred and, and uh, uh, opinion of the president since the war to a, to a memoir that you're underway with yes, now. Yes, I, I, I was asked to do a memoir, but since my life was incredibly boring, I had to do something to, to liven it up. So I am devoting a few pages at each point in my life to the president I was living through uh, during that, that period. During that time. And, uh, and, and I find that they were even worse than I realized at the time. I didn't, I didn't know that Eisenhower overthrew four democratically elected governments while he, was, while he and Dulles were president. Uh, and <laughs> and I, didn't, uh, I didn't know that it was actually Truman and not, and not Eisenhower who was the first one to give aid to, to the French in Indochina, in Vietnam. And I didn't know a lot of the, the terrible things that our presidents did. So, uh, so this has made the book uh, interesting for me, and I hope, I hope for the readers, assuming I finish it some. Well, I hope you do, because I want to have you back, and we'll talk about it. Um, the current president, you're not too fond of him, and I see that in you have an illustration of him as Medusa. Yeah, so the snakes. Well, his hair is his defining feature, so... I turned his hair into snakes, and the snakes were all the things that he had done in his lifetime. Mm. Uh, and of course, Medusa, what was the myth that if you, you saw her or looked at her, your face turned to stone? Yes, and it, he is pretty hard to look at. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yes, but... And listen to, he's hard to listen but to. But in, in a funny kind of way, what really pained me were those presidents who presumably were speaking for me. They were the liberals, the, they were the Democrats, they were the liberals. Uh, when, the, when Republicans did s evil things, I sort of expected it. And besides which, I didn't vote for him. So, uh, but the Democrats broke my heart every time, and uh, without exception. Uh, so uh, how we ended up with Trump is no mystery to me. You also show him, what is it, how should I read this, uh, waterboarding? I mean, I think Lady yeah, Liberty is... Yeah, uh, Graydon Carter, when he was editor of Vanity Fair, asked several artists to do their visions of Trump. And uh, so I did mine, and uh, one, he, his fake, religiosity was what I went with. Mm. So I had him as a minister carrying a sign saying simply, thou shalt not. Mm. Uh, and he was waterboarding liberty, uh, which is, I don't know, it sounds rather over the top when I describe it that way, but maybe the picture was better. Oh, the picture is wonderful. Uh, you mentioned how much the Democratic presidents have disappointed you, and I was looking down the list of uh, archival uh, drawings you sent me, and I only, uh, at least on that list, there was only one Democrat, Carter, and he's in the lion's den. Yeah, Carter was, in a, in a way, more sympathetic than most. I think he, because he was, uh, he was doing the best he could, and he was, he had good, good intentions, I suppose. Uh, but you don't, you don't invite a man like the Shah, who we put into power, and who made a habit of cutting off the hands of children in front of their parents to make them talk while they were being tortured. You don't invite that kind of a man into the country mm. for medical treatment, no matter how, how close he is to death. You let him die. You draw so well when you're angry, and we're gonna show some of your uh, uh, 
drawings as we leave the program, but I want to point out one um, danger of being angry and being a political cartoonist. Uh, Bob Rogers, I don't know if you're familiar with him, no. was fired uh, after 25 years at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette not long ago because he made fun of mm -hmm. Mr. Trump. So there is danger in what you do. Well, n n not for me. I haven't had a job no. since I was a kid. I, so, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yes, of course it is. And, uh, and with people like, uh, like Mr. Trump in power, uh, yeah. having, having, getting angry is a, is a bad idea. But uh, it's a very good idea. History will decide that it's a good idea to get angry now. Yes. Ed Sorrell, it's a delight to see you, to talk with you. I want to continue the conversation, finish that book quickly, and come back. But, but I've got to calm down because I get excited. Yes. Well, <laughs> take this, take this uh, adrenaline and go finish that book this afternoon. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Ed Sorrell, it's a delight. And uh, thank you for watching. We will see you next week.